Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, just before we invited you all into the room, we were all chatting about uh, what a busy time of year it is. So we really do appreciate uh, you making the time for really what is going to prove, I think, to be quite an interesting and important discussion tonight about some of the many challenges that we see um, individuals who live in rural, remote, and First Nations communities who are also struggling uh, to escape family violence. So I'm really excited about the panel tonight. I think you're really going to enjoy um, this discussion. Uh, before we begin, though, um, I really consider it um, a, a privilege to invite us all to think about some of the traditional and unceded lands that you may be on um, in this virtual environment. Um, many of us are here on the banks of the Willistiqui, um, uh, which is also a land of the Maliseet people and their ancestors, along with the Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy tribes and nations, have signed peace and friendship treaties with the British Crown in the 1700s with respect to the lands that uh, many of us gather on now. So we just want to take this moment to sort of encourage all of us to think about the traditional and unceded lands you may find yourself on, but in particular to reflect on what work each one of us can do to breathe life into the truth and reconciliation obligations that we have to these communities, these lands, and their treaties. So in terms of providing you with an overview of uh, what we're going to cover tonight, um, just before we get into the real goods with our panelists, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to the project uh, that brings um, this webinar or from which the webinar uh, comes from. Um, and then we're going to hear uh, from our panelists, hopefully uh, not too much from um, my puppy, who's currently chewing away at my baseboard, um, uh, Krista Matthews, who comes to us from Gig New House, uh, Dr. Mamie Lafergi, who's a postdoctorate fellow at the Miriam McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence, um, Dr. Angela Wisniewski, who's a colleague of mine at St. Thomas University, and uh, Dr. Kathy Holtman. We're going to just cruise along here um, because he's getting loud. So this project um, is really um, an Atlantic uh, Center um, we're part of a national uh, team which was designed to bring together communities of practice, which are groups of stakeholders who have expertise um, and experience in um, family violence in the family law sector uh, to sort of get us all talking to figure out uh, what's working, what's not working, how we could be doing things better. So there are five of these communities of practice that have been established across Canada. Uh, and this is the Atlantic one. Um, we publish research briefs and do many of these kinds of webinars um, as part of the project scope. So I think I'll turn it over now to um, our uh, project coordinator, L.A. Henry, who's going to introduce each of our speakers. Good evening. As Carla said, I'm L.A. Henry. I'm the project manager for the Atlantic chapter of the Family Law Family Viol Violence Project, and I'll be co-hosting tonight along with Carla. So our first presenter is Krista Matthews. She's part of our community of practice and has been a regular attendee for the last two years at our meetings. And she works at Transitional Housing, a house called Gig New House, where she's a crisis counselor and a housing support worker. Um, and she's gonna be looking at the overlay of intergeneral trauma in context of intimate partner violence and the challenge particularly for indigenous women uh, leaving rural First Nations communities. And I, intime et uh, des défis qui, sont conf qui confrontent les femmes autochtones vivant dans les communautés uh, des Premières Nations rurales. La deuxième panéliste, les deux... Dr. Kathy Holtman, uh, are looking at the beginning of an analysis of interview data of survivors in rural and remote northern regions of Canada. And that should be very interesting information. And then finally, we have Dr. Angela Wisniewski, who's an assistant professor at St. Thomas University. And her project is looking back at a project on rural realities from the, both the point of view of service providers and survivors. So without further ado, I'm going to stop my sharing of the screen and I'm gonna open it up to Krista Matthews to begin her presentation.
Hello. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, I, I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> I work at GigNew. I've been there for the last, I'm going to say 12, 13 years. Um, we, we are located in Fredericton, New Brunswick. We service the 15 First Nations in New Brunswick. Um, but right now, Eel Ground is in the process of building their own shelter up north so they can kind of help the northern New Brunswick because we're in Fairton and you know we're three or four hours from you know Miramichi, Bathurst and a lot of the communities a lot of the women don't want to leave their community to come into Fredericton because they just don't want to <laughs> so with that some like some of the challenges the women have is like leaving their communities because they're going to a new city, they have to uproot their kids to a new school, um, leaving their family. And a lot of them don't want to uproot their kids because they're in a First Nations school and they're teaching them their culture and their language. As if you go to the school in the city, they're not getting that. Um, and what else? And another one of the big ones is a lot of the uh, some women don't leave is um, living in a First Nations community is if the women are on social assistance is they don't have to pay rent. The the house is given to the the family. They don't have to pay rent. The band covers a cost of the power. So moving into the city, they have to figure out, okay, how are we going to pay the power? How are we going to pay rent, provide groceries for the kids, pay bills? So it's a whole new learning experience for them. And so sometimes they find it overwhelming. So they just say, or if they do leave, they'll just end up going back because they can't find affordable housing. Or they'll try for like a month or two and they'll be just overwhelmed with you know, the cost of the bills and be like, well, it's just as easy to go back. Uh -huh, what, and a lot of it, like, like you said, is, is intergenerational trauma is they see their parents live it, their sisters, their brothers. And it's just as sad as it is, it's a learned, kind of a learned behavior and it's accepted in a community. Um, in a lot of the communities, they don't have the transportation to get into the city. It's because they're so far out that if they do get into the city and they want to still send their child to the school in the community, they have no way of getting back and forth, no way of going back to like do ceremonial events. Um, just a lot of things like that. I think what else? I try to put this all together while I was on vacation. Um, and a lot of them like they may lose their connection with the key even though they may be being abused they still feel connected to the community and their culture and their partner may be a good dad which is not a good partner and they say because I mean they're he's a good dad and just not a good partner and they're putting their kids needs before their own and if there's a, and I'm not saying every First Nation woman is like this, but there's a lack of education. A lot of the parents, like my mother went to school, but her mother never graduated. And, you know, some parents didn't finish school. So their parents didn't make them finish school. So they just, they just don't know. And it's just, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to teach, we're trying to go into the schools and teach the younger women that, hey, it's okay to speak up. And a lot of them are embarrassed. You know, they figure this should never happen to me. Or if they do seek help with, you know, child and family to reach out for the help, they think they're, they're embarrassed. You know, it, it shouldn't have happened to me. You know, well, how are they going to think, you know, I'm going to be a bad mother. They're going to take my kids away. 
And that's the persona when people do come to GIGNU is, are we gonna call child protection? And we let them know that we're not there to take your kids away. We're just there to give you the tools to be a good mom. Because a lot of times they are a good mom. And we let them know that and yeah. <laughs> We, we are adopting, we do, um, Gignu, we have an outreach worker that is really good with the women. She, you know, will help them once they leave our house to, you know, if they need to go to the food bank or if they just need somewhere to come to kind of like debrief and they come to the house, they can talk to us or they can call us, you know, we let them know, you know, they're once they leave, we just don't kind of drop them. We kind of keep in contact with them, you know. If they're in, we if we do find them affordable housing, you know, we do have some programs like, you know, you come back to the house to, you know, if you want to do, if you want to learn how to cook, if you want to learn how to bake, we try to teach them all that, like the basic skills, because some some moms don't know how to cook. They just don't know the basic needs of having to do that on their own because sometimes it's a partner that does it all. I think that's it. So Kristen, maybe what I'll do is, is kind of prompt you and ask, ask a few more questions because I think we're all really excited to learn from you and you've got a wealth of hands-on experience. Um, so you, you know, one of the focuses here is on the geography, like rural and remote. So I know in yeah, Fredericton, there's, there's three fairly close First Nations, but you're servicing, you said, uh, other all, communities. All 15. Yeah. yeah. So we're located really central in Fredericton. And really, we only have really one close reserve to us is St. Mary's. Kingsclare is still 15, 20 minutes out, or Mokdo is probably a half hour out. So, and we do try to work with the communities, like if a child protection worker will call us, if they want to come from Tobik, they want to come from like Elsa Bookchuk, because that's like what, two, three hours away still. And, you know, a lot of the women don't really want to relocate to Fredericton, but they still need a safe place to go. So we try to help them the best way we can to where they want to live. So if they want to live in, say, you know, if they're from Elsa Bookchuk, if they want to live in Moncton, you know, we try to work with, you know, okay, who's a coordinator for Moncton for MB Housing or is there a nonprofit association in Moncton that does, MB, that does low income housing? And the same thing with, you know, Woodstock. It's kind of easy with Fredericton, Woodstock, and Armada. They're kind of the same, under the same region, but it's when they're out of our region. And, and a lot of the women, when they come to us, is like I said, they're from other communities, is do they want to go back to the community? Do they want to get on income assistance with the province? Do they, or are they still able to stay on assistance from their own community? Because if they're going to eventually go back. So those are a lot of big things you have to figure out for every single individual who comes who comes who in comes to, to our you. house. Yeah. So where they want to live. What kind of bedroom space do you have for residents? We have when people come to what I don't know if everyone knows about each other, but when people come, they think, oh, we're going to go to jail. We're going to have one great big open space. Everyone's going to kind of sleep together. We have five bedrooms that are located. They are in the basement. Um, each room has, a, we can house up to 15 women and children at one time. Okay. That's more um, than I would have expected. That's quite a bit. Yeah. We did a lot of renovations with COVID. So now we have, I tell people this, we did, we got three, three full bathrooms in the shelter. We got two downstairs, one upstairs for the clients, and we have a half of uh, just a powder room for staff. Um, all the rooms are equipped with smart TV, so they're still able to, 
you know, watch TV. You know, they have Netflix. We have iPads that they want to stay connected with their, you know, loved ones. If they decide to come, some women will come without their children and have the children stay with like their grandparents, their mother. And so we let that they can zoom back and forth and still be connected to their family. Yeah. So maybe give us a little snapshot. And I realize every, every woman's situation is different, but you talked about some of the very initial challenges around making the decision to leave and then implementing it. So in your experience, what is it, how is it that women are actually able to physically um, put those things together and, and, and leave, say, Elsa Booktook or Tobik, for, for instance? Um, like if a woman was, um, we've had, for an instance, we had a woman reach out, we have a woman reach out to us through like child and family will call us, say we have a woman, a woman that wants to come to Fredericton, you know, she needs a to get away from her partner. So we bring her and, you know, we ask her, you know, and we don't tell, like, we don't, we don't judge the women when we let them know, you know, if you want to go back with your partner, that's totally up to you. We're not, we're not here to judge you because she ultimately knows what she's going to do anyway. We just can't stop them. So we just, you know, we try to give them the tools they need to be strong enough so they are, they don't fall back into that crack. But a lot of, like I said, I explained a lot of the women don't have the education. So their, their self-esteem is low. You know, they don't think they're worth anything because they're told for so long that they are nothing. It's trying to build their self-esteem back up and make them a strong Indigenous woman. And do you have any kind of communication with either band council or children and family to um, try to help women preserve their connection with the community, even if they've had to leave and also uh, make arrangements for them to be able to participate in important cultural events, that kind of thing? We, only if they allow us, a lot of the women that come into our house, with each community, I, I'm gonna base it on my, my community because I know my community better than any other community, is, they don't like going to child and family because it's hard because they may have relatives like if they may have relatives that are in child and family and they don't want everybody to know their business and it's trying to be you know okay I don't want everyone to know where I am because they're going to think well if this person works at child and family they're going to tell this person this person's going to tell this person and they're really they don't have the, the trust and confidence in someone to keep it confidential right. because their trust may be broken before but each like if we like if we have a woman that wants to go to a sweat because we do have them here in our community we'll just say okay we'll call them and say listen you know this person wants to come to a sweat she's at the house can you just kind of keep an eye on her or if her partner's around just kind of you know, put her, like, not put her away, but kind of take her in the house and let us know that we can come get her. Right, right. Or, um, our, the, our, or our outreach worker will go with her. There is a question in the chat, and it's around restorative justice processes on First Nations. Um, are you aware of any of that? And if so, would they be involved in family violence situations? I don't think, I know our community don't have that. Um, some may have, I really don't do a whole lot with the, the justice system, Yeah. but um, I know our community has um, the matrimony or our own property. So if the, the, the women want to do an EIO, they're able to do the EIO and get the, get the home and get okay. him to leave. Okay. So, so that's each, a... each community has their own kind of, if they, if they want to do it or not, right. It's up to each community, but I know, I know King Sir has that. Yeah. yeah, and just for people listening, the emergency intervention order would be to have, often have the abusive partner removed from the, from the house so that the, the woman and children could stay there in peace for a, a period of, of time, 60 days to 140 days, something like that. The maximum is up to six months. Yeah, okay. Excellent. Um, 
is there any sort of final takeaways that that you think you'd like us to know? I mean, clearly that uh, combination of of the learning curve, the you know physically you know figuring out how to leave, but then even more importantly, that disconnect with the community, the fear of gossip, all of that creates a lot of additional burdens. So, any any final thoughts, Krista? No, <laughs> my brain's <laughs> still on Cuba time. <laughs> yeah, we just got yeah. in like Monday, so <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's just really helpful to begin to hear some of the stories of the challenges that that women face who are living in remote First Nations. Um, and so, you know, this might be a good point to transition to our next speakers. So I'll, uh, I'll thank you and um, pass the baton. Uh, so we have Dr. Mimi Lefergi and Dr. Kathy Holtman, who are going to be presenting on initial findings regarding uh, fleeing uh, rural, remote, and First Nations communities from a study that's still in process. So yeah, please go ahead. Hi, everybody. I'm Kathy Holman. I'm the director of the Miriam McQueen Ferguson Center for Family Violence Research and a professor in the sociology department uh, at UNB. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Mamie and I'm a postdoc at the MMFC. So um, the data that we're going to talk to you about uh, comes from a national project called the Canadian Domestic Homicide Prevention Initiative with Vulnerable Populations. This national project was led by Dr. Myrna Dawson at Guelph University and Dr. Peter Jaff at Western University, and it was funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. About, uh, I guess, about seven years ago, I was invited to be a co-investigator on the project. And the aims were to um, reduce the risk of domestic homicide. We know um, a lot about domestic homicide because we have good data on it, um, because uh, that data is collected by public officials. And, and we know that uh, intimate partner violence is um, uh, underestimated in our country because um, uh, it's either based on self-report or the majority of, of survivors do not uh, tell uh, public service providers or the police. And so domestic homicide is something that we have good data on, but we also know a lot about um, what we can do to, um, uh, what we what are some of the risk factors? So this project wanted to examine uh, risk management, um, a risk assessment and safety planning, and particularly to uh, try to mitigate risk both at the individual and at the community level. And so, there were multiple different kinds of data collected during the project's life. Um, and we're looking at uh, phase three data, which was interviews with survivors of severe domestic and intimate partner violence. And these were qualitative uh, interviews. And so they were conducted by graduate research assistants across the country. And the unique part about this uh, study is that um, everybody who was involved in it, there were quite a few uh, researchers from across the country, we all have access to this confidential data. And so Mamie and I are grateful to the Canadian Domestic Homicide Prevention Initiative for letting us uh, do some uh, preliminary and, and, and ongoing uh, analysis of this research data. And so participants were recruited in a variety of ways. And then um, uh, prior to being accepted into the study, uh, there were screening interviews that were done um, to ensure uh, that, first of all, uh, the, the women were safe and that they were part of a support network that um, they had been relying on since uh, their experiences, that they were no longer in uh, um, dangerous relationships and that they had the support they needed to, to participate in the interview and the follow-up. We also um, had, uh, uh, we wanted people to be uh, rel relatively recent survivors. So um, people who had experienced domestic violence um, between the years of 20, 2006 and 2016 or roughly around that. And, um, and then we, um, after we conducted these uh, screening interviews, if we deemed 
uh, the participants eligible and if they fit into the, the vulnerable categories that the researchers identified. And tonight, we're only looking at transcripts from the women living in rural remote regions of Canada. And these uh, interviews were conducted between 2019 and 2020. And so we have uh, data that we're going to look at from 29 women, and we've analyzed approximately half of them. Just to give you some context before Mamie gets into our analysis, the rate of domestic homicide in rural Canada is significantly higher than uh, in <coughs> urban areas. And um, we know between 2010 and 2018, there were 192 victims of domestic homicide in rural, remote, and northern regions of Canada. There was overlap between the vulnerability that comes with geography in Canada and other aspects of vulnerability that the project looked at, such as Indigenous women, uh, immigrant women, uh, and children victims of um, domestic homicide. And there before you, you see some of the well-known risk factors. And um, uh, certainly the most uh, uh, prevalent one is that uh, the victims of domestic homicide either were currently in or in a strange relationship with the person who murdered them. And there was a history uh, uh, that of the couple having um, experienced domestic violence Firearms play a big role in rural Canada. That's something that researchers at um, the Mira McQueen Ferguson Center have identified for many years as well. Um, the uh, almost a quarter of the participants um, or quarter of the, the murdered um, women and children um, were um, uh, in, in the process of separating. So in the following slides, we're going to detail a few of the broad themes that have emerged so far during our analysis. Um, so when we share each theme, we're also going to share um, first person quotes directly from survivors to help contextualize um, the theme that we're talking about. So these quotes really help provide a snapshot into what the um, geographic and social conditions that are really characteristic of these rural, remote and northern communities um, and the aspects of those communities that make them particularly vulnerable when dealing with intimate partner violence. So I wanted to start off by um, sharing this quote from a survivor with all of you. So in this particular interview, the survivor's abuser was her father and he abused her, her mother and um, her siblings over a multi-year period. So she explained in the interview that her mother was really isolated in her rural community and um, lived on a large property sort of far away from neighbors. Um, the abuser didn't want her to go to town or to work outside of the home and used a lot of financial control and isolation as part of the abuse. So the survivor explained that her and her siblings really fell through the cracks of care growing up. Um, and she also felt that the police weren't particularly helpful in their situation, um, partly because the police knew the abuser and that was sort of the culture in the town of everybody knew everybody. Um, in their situation, there also wasn't a local uh, shelter or any services available to them. So the quote that's on the screen describes an incident of violence soon after her parents separated um, when she was in high school. So she explains, it was probably 11 p.m. and we're driving down these rural back roads, which were very dark, isolated. There's obviously no street lights. There's not a lot of houses, just a lot of nothing. So during this drive, she asked her abuser to help pay for her dress for her graduation, which resulted in an argument um, and then things got quite violent. So she explained that he stopped the truck in the middle of the road, reached over me, opened the door, threw my overnight bag onto the ground, unbuckled my seatbelt, grabbed me by my shoulders and pushed me out of the truck, closed the door and drove away. So in a remote area with no cell phone service, she had to walk for a long time in the cold until she could um, get service in order to call a friend to come and pick her up. 
So as Kathy highlighted, um, domestic and intimate partner, partner violence take place in ways that are both unique and disproportionately high in these rural communities. So we wanted to detail a few of the findings from the interviews that really um, help showcase some of this complexity. So what we saw in the last quote um, and what we'll see in um, the others that we're going to share over the next few minutes is that um, isolation, um, both geographic and socially, is really prominent. So a lot of the survivors shared that they have um, few neighbors or know that they're far enough that um, if violence were to be happening in their home, no one would really hear it. Um, some survivors reported living on farms um, where there would be um, firearms or other weapons. Um, and in some cases too, they reported having pets or farm animals, things that would make it um, difficult to physically leave the space. Um, so survivors also reported living far from services and supports um, in the larger cities and communities that surround them, and they often lack the transportation means to access services on a regular basis or to um, go to a shelter in a larger urban center. Um, Survivors also reported in the interviews that they often felt isolated um, socially from family and friends um, because of the rural context that they lived in. And um, the isolation that they experienced also sometimes involved um, financial or resource restriction as a means of keeping the survivor at home and um, at a distance from social and family connections. Um, several of the interviewees also discussed um, a lack of technological connection, difficulty with cell phone reception or internet, and this was a barrier um, in reaching out to informal supports, but also things like telecounseling. Um, and yeah, more broadly, rural communities lack the services that survivors need, and the services that do exist often lack um, more specialized training. That would be um, like the existing hospitals and schools and police force, um, having those folks um, trained on intimate partner violence. Um, and a really key theme that came up over and over was this sense of um, lack of confidentiality in a small town, which we're gonna explore more. So these are the four main topic areas that Kathy and I are going to cover. So we really wanna dive into um, this lack of confidentiality, um, but also the lack of awareness about what abuse is that a lot of the survivors shared. Um, and we wanted to then briefly touch on the role of shelters and the role of police in rural communities. So the first theme is the sense of the whole town knew um, or that survivors' privacy would somehow not be protected in the process of um, experiencing or reporting domestic violence. So in the interviews that we've analyzed to date, um, many of the interviewees were from really small towns where everyone knows everyone, where there's a lot of tight-knit family relationships. I remember in one of them, of the 220 people who lived in the town, 75 of them were direct relatives to the abuser. Um, so it's very difficult to navigate all of these um, connections for survivors. Um, and sometimes they end up having to live really in close proximity with their abuser, but also all of his um, kinship as well. Um, so because of this, survivors have reported that they're often afraid to access the critical services that they know they need um, because they're afraid that the confidentiality will be breached in some way. Maybe they even know the service providers personally or the service providers know the abuser. Um, those types of dynamics were, were talked about a lot. And 
Um, this was also experienced by community members at large, um, being afraid to report because of the consequences or if there could be possible retaliation. I remember in a few that we've analyzed, um, folks were really fearful of the abuser. They knew this was happening, but they too were really afraid to report or to be known to have reported. Um, so because of all of this, survivors frequently reported feelings of shame or feeling like people in the community are talking about them or know about um, intimate details of their personal life. And this um, has led to a lot of feelings of being isolated in a, and alone in what they're going through. So um, here's another example of uh, this theme of the whole town new. So this woman who went to file court papers related to her abuse realized that it was her abuser's friend working at the courthouse. And so, um, and, and people tended to take sides in these situations. And so um, depending on, on what side they took, it made it awkward for, for survivors. Um, and she explains, this court employee would also, during the trial, sit with him on his breaks and console him, saying, don't worry, you'll be partying soon enough. And she said it loudly so I could hear, right? So it became, it, everybody was related. It felt like I felt very alone in that small town. He grew up there and uh, I didn't grow up there and he did. Sorry, Mimi, I think I took your slide. Anyway, I'll keep going here. So the sense that the whole town knew is, is juxtaposed with this other sense that um, they knew something was going on, but it's not being named and it's not being addressed directly. And so people know they take sides and they hear it. So in this uh, quote that you have before you, the survivor is 56 years old. Mm -hmm. She was in a common law relationship with the abusive partner for 21 years. Uh, she had brought in two children into the relationship from a previous relationship and then they had two together and they were living in um, rural Ontario. And she says, people heard me yell out the windows for help and nobody called anybody. Everybody was afraid of him, which is something that Mamie has already pointed out. So there's this um, fear in the community, there's this knowledge in the community, but then there's a lack of knowledge about what to do um, and, and how to respond in ways that are safe and helpful to uh, the survivor and, and her children. Over to you, Mamie. So the second theme that we wanted to discuss is this difficulty in identifying the abuse um, in addition to seeking help um, within the community. So for example, survivors often um, told the interviewers that they didn't see the warning signs of abuse until they were really deep within the cycle or were in the relationship um, for many years and you know owned a home, owned a farm, worked together, all of these complex um, relations. Um, so survivors often felt confused and overwhelmed, um, embarrassed. They feared reporting um, and if they would lose their kids or be seen as an unfit parent. They also um, feared being stigmatized for having mental health problems or to um, finally come forward with the abuse and then not be believed or, or validated within the system or to potentially make their lived reality even more dangerous by reporting. Um, so we have an example here. So this particular survivor um, is a, a, a woman who was a member of a religious group called the Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, her abusive partner was 17 years older than her, and uh, they lived in rural Ontario. And um, as you can see in the quote here, uh, she understood that um, what her partner was going through was a result of um, mental health problems. PTSD, 
uh, he was being bullied and harassed at work. And so she felt a, um, an obligation to care for, for him uh, and, and his complex problems. But what we find out in the interview is that in fact, he was also a member of this uh, faith community and um, he sexually assaulted her uh, while he was married. And he said to her, um, so you and I have committed adultery and um, I need to divorce my wife and we need to get married because we've committed adultery. And she being a young adult and knowing nothing about sexual violence or not having heard any kind of message from her faith community or um, no one reached out to her because, um, you know, it turns out that, that people were aware that uh, he was he was not um, he was not a well person, and that he didn't treat uh, his his previous wife well either. But nobody said anything about it, and so um, she thought she was responsible to help him. But then learned when she went to a shelter that she was being manipulated, and she developed a language that could describe what was going on. But her uh, worldview and the way that the members of her community explained what was going on didn't help her to recognize that this was abuse and, and violence. And so community organizations like religious organizations, churches also are not helping survivors understand what they're going through. So this leads really well um, into our next point about really the critical role that shelters play. We heard this over and over in the interviews and felt it was really important um, to highlight um, the impact of shelters on the lives of those who were able to access them really can't be understated. And we wanted to, to share that. Um, the interviewees reported that um, going to the shelter offered a sense of non-judgmental support and validation, um, opportunities to connect with other survivors through things like peer support groups, um, and that shelters were this sort of vital link to other resources in the community like mental health care, addiction care, um, and other community-based services. Um, and shelters were also a really uh, meaningful source of education um, and helped survivors with things like safety planning or just really understanding that what they're experiencing is abuse. Um, and several interviewees also talked about the physical space of the shelter um, being a safe and secure place where they felt like they could decompress. Um, I know several of the interviews I've read talked about security cameras and just knowing that that was a space where they were um, on some level protected and could um, uh, rest for a little while. So we also heard from other interviewees challenges in accessing shelter services. Sometimes they were just not available in rural communities or um, you would have to leave your community to go to the nearest shelter and this could mean uprooting your kids. Um, like Krista was saying earlier, um, leaving pets behind, having your kids start new schools, these types of real challenges on top of um, the intimate partner violence um, can just be really difficult. Um, interviewees also talked about how shelters aren't always well set up for um, living like a family like you would at home um, and struggling to want to be in that safe space but also wanting their normal routines and environment and seeing that as Im important particularly for children um, and we also heard that there are still a lot of misconceptions and stigma around what the role of a shelter is and who should be accessing it. Um, the stigmatization sur ce qu'est un refuge et uh, quel genre de personnes s'y rendent. Je sais dans une des entrevues, uh, les, les femmes disaient qu'elles pensaient qu'elles ne pouvaient pas avoir accès aux, ab aux refuges si elles n'étaient pas sans abri. Uh, donc elles ne se sentaient pas bienvenue là-bas. Donc nous avons ici une citation qui démontre très bien le rôle des refuges. Et là maintenant, dans cette entrevue spécifiquement, 
la femme était en train de raconter à la personne qui prenait dans l'entrevue comment est-ce que le refuge lui a permis d'avoir accès à des services euh, de famille, leur a permis d'avoir accès à de la thérapie familiale, leur a permis, lui a permis d'avoir accès aussi à de l'aide juridique pour son divorce. Euh, elle a été mise en contact avec une liste d'avocats à rencontrer pour sa, sa, dans sa ville à Ontario. Donc, euh, ce sont des facteurs qui lui ont permis de faire face à ce contexte difficile de divorce. Nous avons aussi vu qu'il y avait beaucoup d'expériences de, très différentes avec la police. La majorité des expériences et des entrevues, euh, des comptes rendus d'entrevues que j'ai lues, ont mentionné que certaines victimes sentaient qu'elles pouvaient faire confiance à la police. And we found it very interesting that in several of the interviews, uh, the abusive partners seem to have been connected with some kind of crime network. And in these cases, the response of the police was, was very interesting because the, the reality of the woman's experience of domestic violence was in these cases almost always discounted. It was like it wasn't, it wasn't the primary concern. This crime of domestic violence seemed to be a lesser crime or they, she was less deserving of protection for, for that crime because by association with, with her partner, she was part of these crime networks. In a way that the survivors were um, almost treated like collateral damage in larger crime investigations. And they didn't um, get sort of the trauma informed um, uh, care that, that, that we would have wanted to see because they were part of, of crime. And in some cases, the, the patterns of abuse, um, which involved coercive control, meant that the women were forced uh, to be accomplices in some of these crimes. And, um, but the police didn't see that. They just saw them as criminal themselves um, along with uh, their partners. Yeah, we wanted to briefly share an example of that. Um, so in this quote, Um, this is from an interview where the survivor um, assisted her abuser in defrauding his insurance company, and they were both charged and sentenced um, for this um, criminal activity. And she had previously dealt with police um, before this incident and um, was given a lot of care and, and resources as a survivor of um, domestic violence. But once she had committed a crime, um, it's like that was taken off, off the table. Um, so she had a really difficult experience after that um, and explained when I wanted to go into the court and say, you know what, I did this out of abuse, out of fear. Um, he the police officer wouldn't allow it to be heard. He wouldn't allow anything to be heard about abuse because he said, I did it all out of my own free will. He had no concept of abuse and no concept of what a woman endures going through that. So we thought that was a really powerful quote to share. So our last slide here is just a teaser really. Um, so uh, we are also looking at uh, the women's suggestions for improving the response of public service providers or informal uh, social support networks. Um, but we don't have time this evening to go to it, um, but we will be presenting on this aspect of our analysis at the MMFC Research Day, which is gonna take place on October 26th. So just a plug for that. If you wanna hear um, more about our analysis, we'll be happy to share it with you then or during the Q&A. So thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much, Amy and Kathy. 
Um, so we've got our final presenter. We have Angela uh, Wisniewski, who's going to be presenting on research that she's done. And I'll let you just uh, take it away. Okay. Uh, so folks, I hope everyone can hear me all right. I'm very grateful to be part of tonight's discussion. Uh, so for my contribution tonight, I'm going to look back at uh, the Rural Realities Project, uh, which, which is a project that we carried out uh, here in New Brunswick uh, between the years of 2014 to 2016. It was a project coordinated by the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center, as well as New Brunswick Association of Social Workers, with support from the Canadian Observatory on the Justice System's response to intimate partner violence. So folks, I think that some of the material I'm about to work through will by now really resonate with the other presentations uh, and points that have come out of the discussion so far. What may be a little bit different uh, and unique about my presentation is that uh, the Rural Realities Project looked at the experiences of uh, women survivors of IPV from rural communities, uh, but it had a dual focus of also looking at uh, service providers in rural communities uh, and some of the experiences that they had uh, when helping women uh, survivors of IPV to navigate through all levels of the justice system. Uh, so I'll jump right into this discussion. You can see the two goals of the project here overarching and I think maybe get a sense of the diversity of different people who we either interviewed or did focus groups with for this study. Uh, so yeah, this study, I'll just briefly touch on methods before I get into the core of what I'm sure everyone is most interested to hear, which is some of our qualitative data. Uh, so this was a qualitative project. Our, our you know, goal was to understand a little bit more about what things were currently working well in terms of justice system and associated supports uh, for folks from rural communities, uh, as well as what perhaps was not working so well. Uh, so our sample included four different rural communities uh, from different regions of New Brunswick. Uh, so we carried out some interviews and focus groups in uh, Restigouche, Northumberland and Charlotte counties. So looking at the map, it was a pretty, pretty broad representation. Also looking at uh, the linguistic and cultural characteristics of those regions very broad as well um, in terms of conducting um, these uh, these discussions in, in French and English, as well as going to a couple of different First Nations communities in different parts of the province. Uh, so uh, the number overall of participants that we got is relatively small. Obviously, we can't make big numerical claims about what was happening with everybody. Uh, but using our qualitative methods, we can get an insight into how people were understanding their experiences. Uh, so we did very wide discussion of what it was like to live and work in rural communities, uh, as well as uh, trying to gain insight into participants' understandings of the different elements of the justice system that you see listed here. So now I'll share a little bit about some of the, the key themes that came out of our research. And again, I think they connect really well to what the presenters have already said tonight. Um, okay. So let's get started with that. Uh, so the survivors who we spoke to as part of this research project uh, spoke about problems they encountered with the justice system in the context of uh, the communities in which they were living. And those were communities in which they often felt isolated and isolated because of the small population, but also because of elements of the community's attitudes. Uh, so like other studies of rural Canadian communities, including some of the research that we've just heard about, uh, there were attitudes that were made it very difficult for survivors of violence to talk about their experience. Uh, so some elements of the social climate that we heard about uh, included things like respect for family independence, uh, respect for privacy of neighbors, perhaps over concern for common welfare. 
And the idea generally that abuse was not the responsibility of a neighbor to intervene with. Um, in addition, we heard uh, that uh, women often felt pressured not to separate uh, from their abusive partner, uh, but to find a way to stay in the situation. Um, and again, in common with uh, some of the other research that we'd read on rural communities, uh, we found women talking about how they located supports in their rural communities but those supports often came with strings attached. So for instance, they could get help with um, you know, temporary housing for themselves or their children or help with childcare or something like that. Uh, but then the, you know, the people offering that would also assume that they would return to the abusive, that the woman would return to the abusive relationship. So um, they also found that uh, community supports had little knowledge of any sort of more formal uh, support systems. Uh, so there was little knowledge kind of transmitted about, uh, you know, broader, uh, broader supports that could be accessed inside the community or outside of it. Uh, another element of community attitudes uh, in rural areas in New Brunswick that we went to that was problematic uh, was the fact that uh, men were noted as occupying positions in the community that contributed to their influence and respect and women didn't quite have that same experience so this participant gives us a little taste of what that might be like uh, she says everyone knows his name uh, he's lived here for his whole life and his family's lived here for their whole lives uh, whereas my family, we were a military family and we moved a lot. So it looks like I have the unstable environment for my child and everyone in the town thinks he's the cat's meow. Uh, so in addition to the challenges of being isolated, again, socially as well as geographically, uh, there is the obstacle of what happens when survivors uh, do try to disclose the violence uh, or leave their abusive situation. Uh, so here's from the words of one survivor who we talked to and she says, we're all from the same community. We're all somebody's brother, sister, daughter, mother, uncle, or whatever. Uh, from somebody who's working at the police station or council or services, somehow, somewhere, we're all connected. Uh, and if I out my father, I'm outing his brother and his children and their problems and everybody else's. So the best thing to do is to shut up, right? And not to talk. Sorry, that was actually a quote from a rural service provider. Uh, so this there was a, a huge concern um, that we heard about uh, surrounding lack of confidentiality uh, and what might happen when other members in the community found out that abuse was going on. Uh, this was expressed in a lot of different ways. Uh, participants were concerned about folks in the community, their communities doing things like listening to police scanners, to find out what was going on, um, and as well as learning from the news perhaps what had happened in court. Uh, so this brings us into the question or into the area of the study that looks at um, how women interacted with the justice system. And so the first point of interaction uh, was often with the police. Uh, so here's a little bit of what we learned, uh, again, from both service providers and from women about some challenges associated uh, with policing. Uh, so from both survivors and police, uh, we really heard about uh, the different challenges that related to not having police available in, in rural communities, not readily available uh, and not uh, knowledgeable about the rural communities, not like familiar with the rural communities in a close and immediate way. Um, and this created all kinds of problems. Uh, so here's a quote from one rural service provider that I think touches on this. Uh, they say the relationship between us police and community is pretty good, uh, but the real challenge is having not having a resource in your own community. Uh, it's a challenge because proactive policing is probably just as important as reactive, actually more important. Uh, where the RCMP, it's more reactive. You call them, they show up. Once in a while, they'll make their move, they'll make their appearance, sure, but they're spread so thin. Uh, we also heard uh, from, again, from both service providers and um, 
survivors of violence, uh, that response times were a huge problem. Uh, it took a really long time for the police to reach uh, women when they did make a call asking for help. Um, and that was made even worse in the winter, right? During a snowstorm, the road conditions could make that travel even longer. Uh, it was even worse uh, at times of uh, the night when calls were really likely to come in to police uh, between like 10 at night and four in the morning, um, tend to beat the times uh, when our participants said most calls were happening. And those are also times when police were a little bit less, um, you know, fully staffed and able to respond to those calls. Um, so continuing on with some of the key ideas that came out of our research, uh, there were also a number of challenges that both service providers and, uh, and survivors talked about when it came to, you know, working with the courts, uh, filing paperwork and that kind of thing. Uh, so there were all kinds of challenges associated with getting access to legal information and services. Uh, so our participants really highlighted that going to court would be very difficult for them. It would cost money. Uh, they would have to hire a lawyer, take time off work, and it was very, very expensive to travel. Um, uh, and so this was a, a common theme uh, that these kinds of problems layered on top of each other to make you know, going to court seemed just out of the picture. Um, service providers also added that they had tons of trouble trying to uh, get legal services and to uh, get their clients started with court uh, processes if they wanted to do that. So here's a quote from a rural service provider, tells us a little bit about this scenario. Uh, they say, we've begged and pleaded and made a fuss uh, but for some of our clients, there's so much resistance. Uh, they say, well, she has no vehicle. Yes, she has a vehicle. She's not working, so she has the time. She doesn't have the gas money. She doesn't have that. And the fact that they just have to fill in a very brief application, it's going to make me take me three hours because it's going to take me an hour to get in there. It's going to take three hours for the outreach program to do something that you could do six or seven minutes over the phone. So uh, service providers had just tons of stories of driving back and forth on their clients' behalf between rural communities and urban settings where um, they could file documents on, uh, on behalf of the women who they were working with. Uh, when it came to going into courts, this often involved traveling to an urban, urban center. Uh, and that brought out a lot of different fears uh, for, for women about what might happen uh, on the occasion of a court day or court appearance. Uh, so a couple of themes here that came out of our data uh, that relate to the powerlessness that women tended to feel in, in this situation in this time. Uh, so one is like fears of physically encountering the abuser. Uh, so fears of being present in court, uh, being the same city, which is a strange city, right? Not your own city, um, an unfamiliar building, you know, finding parking, walking to the courthouse, perhaps uh, encountering uh, your abusive uh, partner. Uh, being in the same building with them was a real source of, of fear. Uh, of course, in common with other studies looking at women's experiences in the justice system, we heard the theme uh, that uh, women felt a lot of fear that their abusers would use the system to uh, control or manipulate them, uh, you know, trying to essentially disqualify them um, and uh, render their accounts illegitimate. So uh, one quote that I want to share here comes from a survivor who says, look, it's so easy for, for him to discredit me. Uh, she says to me, it's really a bad game of poker. Uh, and the hand that is dealt toward the person who's being abused or mistreated in any shape or form um, becomes, uh, it, it becomes really the center of the problem. Uh, so service providers also shared some of the anxieties about being in court. Uh, we heard from a rural service provider who said, look, for those of us who work in small communities where 
everybody knows each other, it's really difficult uh, to then also appear in court and give evidence. Um, so she says, who's going to want to come to me for help? Uh, if I have to get on the stand and say some things that I know that not everybody knows. It's not going to be a good situation. Uh, it's a bad situation in a small rural area, area because word gets out. Uh, so a final little piece that I want to share uh, with you that we heard in, in these interviews, uh, this has to do with the length of court uh, pro processes and how hard these were for uh, rural women to, to address and deal with. Um, so just a couple of quotes, I'll run through them and leave them, I suppose, for you to think about. Uh, so one of the survivors in our study says, you know, everything's been filed, but I think in this case, if I recall, she's talking about divorce documents. They've been filed. Um, yes, I've not been in front of the judge yet for a divorce, and it's been, I'm sorry, I'm like, my little thing here is, it's been six years. Uh, the only thing I want in life, Lord forgive me, I just want rid of this man. I want my name back to my maiden name. I want no association with him and his family. Similarly, uh, another survivor told us, if we want to leave to get a job, I have to file, uh, I have to file to the court in order to be allowed to leave this town to support myself and my son. So we end up living on a very minimal income and his medication cost is through the roof. How do you keep your sanity when this stuff is going on? Uh, I'm afraid we had no conclusive answer to how you keep your sanity in a situation like that. Uh, but we did have a number of recommendations that uh, we came out of this uh, study with. Uh, so part of the study involved going back to these communities uh, a few times, as well as holding uh, a major session at the end of the project uh, that involved uh, service providers and policymakers. Uh, from a variety of different branches of, of government uh, and taking a look at, you know, how more integrated systems of support could be offered um, so that uh, victims didn't have to feel so alone uh, in managing these concerns that really, as those last quotes show, sometimes went on for years. There's no quick fix. Uh, so, I hope that this uh, material, you know, adds and complements some of the other things that we've heard about tonight. And I'll look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, I I got to say I I am super um, impressed by just how much the the overlap is between all three of the presentations. Um, the the time has gone quite well. So at this point, we are going to open it up to questions and answers. Um, and at the moment, we only seem to have one question. So I'm sure there's a lot of you out there who, who do have more questions for our various panelists. I'll read the one that we do have. Um, Haley Crisell asks, I was wondering if someone could comment on some changes that can be made to policy for shelters who service Indigenous women fleeing violence. Thanks. So. Um, I'm curious, Haley, if you know uh, what you're thinking of in terms of the need for changes, but I'm wondering um, if Krista might want to comment on that one. Not to put you on the spot or anything, Krista. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, my kids are, um, the kids are doing their homework too. Okay. You're multitasking. What, yeah, what was the question about? Well, it was about changes to policies that service Indigenous women. I'm not sure what changes she had in mind, but maybe you could maybe comment on the, the things you think are important in terms of policies for, for shelter servicing Indigenous women. I think <coughs> maybe some like the other shelters in the province of New Brunswick be more aware of culture sensitivity right um we get a lot of women from like that are coming from other shelter that were at other shelters and they feel like they're discriminated really? because it's hard to explain 
indigenous they you kind of got to talk and treat indigenous mm-hmm. women different than non-indigenous women mm-hmm. because of the trauma they've been through okay and that's trauma related to the intergenerational col- trauma right yeah. col- colonialism all yeah. that kind of stuff right so a lack of awareness of that yes and assumptions being made that what's kind of so-called normal i mean anytime someone's leaving a, a, a violent situation n- nothing's very normal for them but still there are certain things that are counted on as kind of normal mainstream culture that could be quite different for an indigenous woman and you know a, a, even allowing them to practice their own culture into the shelter like them smudging right like right. you may not be you may not allow it at least inside at least outside yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense so they can feel like you know because some of the women do smudge and I mean we allow it we don't allow downstairs obviously because the smoke detectors right they go off quite well oh, we tried that before <laughs> so we have a, an area in our shelter where you know they're able to smudge there or if they feel more comfortable to take it outside yeah so, you know maybe other shelters be more aware of that yeah even perhaps invite people in such as yourself or, or other people who work at Giga New House to, to do some training and education on servicing transitional housing for Indigenous women. Okay, thank you. Did anyone else from the panel want to weigh in on that one? I do. Okay. Um, Mamie emphasized this during our presentation, but I think it bears saying again, the shelters played an enormous role in helping the women to identify what they were going through as abuse. Mm. And and this was this was difficult to read because we were reading transcripts from women who's you know who could have died multiple times over, you know, and who survived um, really uh, extraordinary kinds of violence. And um, and although they 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 lived that, it wasn't until they went to the shelter that that and they felt safe first of all, physically safe. So some women talked about you know like I like I I could breathe at the shelter. I, I couldn't even, you know, um, breathe right because she was so terrified most of the time. Um, and then the the other uh, thing was um, it 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 provided them the safe space, and I think the the capacity to identify themselves as a survivor because of the stigma. There was such stigma um, about about you know either you know your your marriage not working or or being you know a, a battered woman. That, that that was still very very strong, and so that 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 prevented them from naming these extraordinary experiences of violence as as violence and as abuse, you know. And so the shelters, by providing safety, both physical and emotional and psychological safety, and then again the expert um, care that these well trained service providers have. So I guess one of my policy, you know suggestions is we need more uh we need more shelter um funding we need core funding for shelter services shelters are are making do uh project to project um and in a competitive um uh, environment where they are going after funding so that they can hire people for um you know so, to cover some of their needs but they are inadequately funded and they play uh, especially in rural communities they are they're saving lives and going above and beyond. And so a big policy uh, suggestion for me, and, and I know the federal government has given more money towards um, indigenous uh, shelters in indigenous communities, but I just can't um, emphasize enough in our rural areas, uh, the, the shelters are saving lives. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Um, there's some more comments. Some people are using chat and some are using Q&A. It, it's probably a little easier if maybe we stuck with Q&A, but I'll go back and forth. So. Right now in chat, Holly Richardson uh, speaks about the just the systemic barriers. And her question is, what options are there for community champions slash allies? Anybody want to jump in on that one? I, I'm, not, I'm not certain, but I, I'm guessing that she's thinking beyond service providers, um, but to basically being a better neighbor perhaps. Uh, 
I'll just jump in really quickly to say that uh, that was an idea that a lot of the rural service providers came up with as well and thought was important as well. Um, both in the sense that they were willing to take on extra duties in their own job roles to like cross cross train makes it sound like fitness, but to job shadow uh, and learn some different roles in the community, but also to have a wider array, array of uh, community members who are active on uh, on uh, violent anti-violence education uh, and violence prevention. And so uh, we heard about the importance of having religious leaders and, um, you know, people who do kids camps and teachers um, and community elders all be more involved. Um, so, so yeah, it's a great, really great direction. Those are really good suggestions. It'd be, yeah, that, that's awesome. Um, Amrita Shavan asked about this being made available. And yes, this is gonna be published on the website of the Muriel McQueen Ferguson Center probably within about two weeks. So you're you're welcome to share this, this webinar. Um, okay, Samantha Yatsi is asking, service providers need to have an understanding of lived experience of Indigenous peoples. This includes the systemic discrimination they face their whole life. There's a lot of mistrust, broken trust, and dehumanization. Um, and she talks about uh, witnessing women being labeled as difficult or unwilling to engage. Um, and, and that this can be triggering. I, th I think this is absolutely right. And it seems to me that's a little bit what uh, Krista has spoken to in terms of the challenges of, of building trust with women who have the experience of um, you know, being oppressed by colonization as well. Anyone else wanna comment on that any further? Okay. I'm going to jump to the Q&A. So Eileen Hunter asked, what would be considered severe IPV from one of the studies? I mean, homicide, obviously, but, but is there a kind of a defining factor? Um, I think guns, you know, having guns regularly pointed at your head and being threatened at gunpoint was something that we read uh, fairly frequently, um, or that guns were hidden. You know, there were stashes of, of guns uh, around. Um, sexual violence, enormous um, uh, uh, stories of, of sexual violence and women's ways of, of coping with uh, this very severe violence and, and surviving it was strategic, was, was to um, comply with uh, the demands of their abuser so that they would stay alive. I stayed alive by, by being passive. I stayed alive by, um, you know, having a plan for my kids. It, just strategies to try to outmaneuver uh, a, a very violent situation. That's some of the things that, that we saw, but guns and, um, and, and then uh, these criminal networks, the, that, that was very, very scary. So uh, that, uh, you know, they kind of tried to align themselves with people who are more powerful in these networks, because if they came from a family that was less powerful, they were more vulnerable. And mm -hmm. so they were choosing between um, levels of violence in order to stay alive. Wow, that is One scary. is really, um, another one is, is really, we try to hit with the women is choking. Mm. Yeah. You know, oh, he, he choked me only for, you know, five or six seconds. Right. I almost, you know, because that can be, it can turn bad fast, right? With choking. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, Kathy, I did have one follow-up question regarding guns. Um, Kathy and I both lived in a, a rural community for quite a few years, and gun culture from the point of view of hunting is big. It's, it's really, 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 it, before I lived there, I, I had mostly lived in cities, but I think I'd only lived in cities and I had really no conception of it. So what I'm curious about, you, you talked right now about guns used as threats. Um, to what degree would you say um, gun violence is a major part of domestic homicide or domestic injury? I mean, I think it's a continual threat. And I think it's this part of, you know, that, that, that quote that I 
I paraphrased about being able to breathe. Mm. Um, you know, this other woman, um, you know, she was asked when she was safe and she said, I only felt safe when he was in prison. Mm. It was the first time I ever opened my windows because, you know, he, he always had access to a gun and he, and he threatened to use, and he did use it, right? Like, I mean, the, um, one woman living on a rural property, um, you know, he, he abused their horses and, and then eventually ended up, um, uh, shooting her dog. And, and that was kind of the thing that, that, that woke her up. Wow. This is really bad because, you know, he's actually killed my dog, but he's, he threatened to kill her. And, right. and, you know, and so the, just the level of threat right. that a gun poses is, is so enormous. I think what you're telling me is that if it's a situation of domestic violence and if guns are part of the home, that's almost going to be an automatic threat that implied explicit in some way yeah okay thank you anonymous has asked could one of the panelists speak to the unique challenges faced by immigrant and newcomer women in rural communities as well as how shelters could better support them that's a great question um i i think i'll, I'll take that i'm talking too much but that that happens to be one of the areas that that i actually do most of my research in and and we know that there are enormous barriers uh, similar to um, different, but but in some ways similar to what Krista mentioned in terms of culturally appropriate or culturally sensitive services. Mm -hmm. And so we have um, uh, immigrants from a variety of ethnic, cultural and religious backgrounds um, who are not part of, of the majority culture. And, and so some of their perspectives in terms of uh, collectivist values, or um, uh, their, their religious perspectives are, are quite different. Um, their dietary restrictions, the way in which they dress, some of the cultural codes of interactions between uh, people of different genders, they're very different. And our service providers uh, don't get the training um, that they need in order to, to respond. And they don't know these communities. Um, mm -hmm. These are relatively new in Atlantic Canada, for sure, compared to other parts of the country. We have low levels of, um, diversity uh, in our communities. And so this is relatively new. And so um, people don't, don't know um, the minority groups in their community to the extent that we should. Um, and so there's a lot of um, interaction and bridge building to be done. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Rena Arsenault asks, I understand what you're stating, Kathy. I think this must go back to something you were saying a little earlier, but sometimes shelters are not possible because of the size of the community. What other services would be beneficial? Mimi, do you want to address that? Um, I think a few things that come to mind would be transportation services. Um, and we know that the role of outreach workers is really prevalent with um, sort of being that link for women who um, choose not to come to shelter. Those are the, the first two things um, that, that come to mind. I know there are second stage housing programs and sort of different living arrangements that could be made safe that are not the physical shelter um, that communities could consider. I don't know if others have um, ideas Well, nobody's jumping in, so <laughs> that's that's good. That was a certainly a very comprehensive answer. Um, we, I think we're pretty much done with our questions, unless anybody wants to to jump in at the last minute. Uh, one comment that was made earlier, and I just wanted to to add to it, is um, regarding EIOs. Uh, one person commented that they also can include parenting orders, and that's absolutely correct. So. If you um, look up the legislation, uh, there's specific legislation to support people that are looking to um, secure a safe environment for themselves. So it could involve getting uh, the house for themselves. They could have parenting orders that would uh, limit or pr prevent the abusive partner from having any contact with themselves or the kids. And, and potentially could also begin the process of child support. So those have been 
those are relatively recent in the province, but they've been used to very good effect. And uh, yeah, so thank you for adding to that comment. Um, we may just have gotten a couple more questions. Let's see. Uh, Melanie Samarie asks, I'm curious how the house's needs are met in terms of resources and what needs go unmet. Is there any community supports that could be helpful? So um, I'm guessing that, that that question has to do with when a relationship breaks down and there's a financial lack. Um, I'm not sure, but does anyone have any thoughts about that? I think um, part of it goes back to um, the difficulty in identifying what one is experiencing as domestic violence. So that's a, a, a huge step. But then the when 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 one does that, one has access, and then you know obviously if one is identified as a victim of crime, there is access to supports um, and 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 resources for victims of crime. But but there's a, there's a long journey to get to those resources. And so I don't know if, if, if that's what's being meant there, but um, uh, I think that, uh, you know, the, the disclosure or the identification of what's going on and, and, you know, you've got a whole community that's resisting um, defining what's going on as what's going on. And so even if an individual has the courage and, and the, the opportunity to do that, she may not be believed by those in, in her social circles, right? And so there's there's kind of multiple barriers to accessing some of these publicly available resources to victims of crime because, because they, they're not talking about what's really going on. Yeah, absolutely. A few more questions. So Diana Wark asks, I'm curious what is happening in these rural communities around prevention, healthy relationship discussions within traditional teachings and within school-based education. Do we have any data around that? Um, I'll chime in. We don't. I don't have a lot of data about that. Um, however, it was mentioned by some of the participants in our study that um, at the level of public school education on uh, healthy and health, unhealthy relationships and violence prevention and those kinds of topics. Uh, that would be an item that might come into a curriculum, maybe as a special day or a special event, uh, but it wouldn't be regularly reinforced. And furthermore, um, it's not consistent necessarily from, from school to school and, and year over year. So uh, I think that there's programs out there uh, that have been developed. That's my sense, uh, but it's advocating for them to be a more integrated part of uh, what a school teaches. Yeah, for sure. Um, question from Trevor Williams regarding the idea of allies and prevention of VV instances in communities and measures slash programs regarding faith groups in particular, have you come across specific resources or programming that has had positive impacts on isolated communities in Canada? Again, I can talk to faith groups. So um, the religion and violence research team at the Mira McQueen Ferguson Center has done extensive studies um, uh, throughout Canada and the United States and, and internationally on uh, the response of faith communities and religious leaders and the, and the important role that they can play um, in, especially in rural communities where often uh, churches play a, a much uh, larger role in the community than perhaps in urban centers. And so um, the Religion and Violence e-learning project is a uh, we call it the rave project it's got an online it's got a website with online training for religious leaders and members of, of faith groups and um, uh, you know it's it, it is a I think a, a really important resource in communities um, because faith groups also um, you know when they're well trained and when they when they understand the problem of domestic violence they have resources that they can draw on and so they have physical spaces, you know, um, they, can, they can provide um, places where um, maybe mothers and children can have some respite or provide spaces where there could be supervised uh, visitation, um, you know, when there are cases where, where, where that is necessary. We know that when religious leaders uh, work together with professionals, with um, men who have acted abusively, 
they are more likely to complete uh, batter intervention or batter or treatment programs. So that the, the moral authority that religious leaders carry within communities can be harnessed to compel uh, men who act abusively to um, do what needs to be done, at least according to the criminal justice system or, or to encourage them to seek help. And then there are um, also enormous resources for um, uh, the comfort and care of survivors and, and, and their children. So religion, um, in, you know, in, in when, it's, when it's used well, is a, is a community of caring and practices of caring are central to faith communities. You know, they, they make food, they offer shelter, you know, they, and they, they, they are sources of comfort. And so often religious communities don't realize that these resources are exactly the kinds of things that survivors and their families need. Um, but religious leaders and their communities need to be well-trained because um, uh, it, it is, we know that they, they too are, are slow to recognize um, the signs of abuse. Uh, they are in denial about the prevalence of abuse in their communities. And then they're unprepared to to uh, respond appropriately. So there's lots of work to be done, but they they can be enormous resources in those rural communities. And so yeah. the Brave Project website is one place to start. Thanks, Kathy. I, I knew you'd have a lot to, to share on that topic. Um, I have two questions, but I'm going to combine them because they're kind of connected. Uh, Melanie Samari clarified that she was talking about um, Krista's organization, what resources they are working with, and what needs go unmet. And then Holly Richardson asked Krista to elaborate on the smudging and spiritual practices and how shelters might be able to facilitate this in a better way. So I think I'm going to, you know, toss that one over to Krista if she wants to weigh in on this. Well, the second part is making the smudge, having the smudge bowls there and the, the medicine for them to smudge. Um, and we have it, have it out so they can see it, that it's not kind of put away and they have to ask for it. And the other question is, um, I'm not quite sure I understand what she means. I, I guess she's, I, I think maybe what she's asking is what things do you see that the needs that are still going unmet by women that come to your to your house? I think a lot of the, the needs that are unmet is, I guess, them having legal advice. Okay. You know, or the, what we find happens is the women, you know, start the legal aid process for custody, then the husband throws the divorce in. So then they go, there goes our legal aid. Mm. Because legally don't do, don't do divorce so then yeah. the women are you know where do they go from there and that that's a good point I, just to clarify they do do divorce sometimes now if there aren't a lot of property issues involved so that's a step in the right direction but it's still something that many women can't access for that for that reason so yeah well, and the kind of, it's kind of hard with property because you're on a First Nations community. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, if it's a band owned home, then neither one of them own it. Yeah. But like, then, you know, that's back and forth. And then, you know, okay, you had to go back to the community and see, you know, okay, who's going to get the home kind of with, kind of with a chief and council kind of thing. Negotiation. Yeah. And a lot of them won't because, you know, like it was said before, the trust confidentiality or you know the partner is his family's in chief and council yeah. well obviously they're going to get it he's going to get it yeah those are unique challenges for sure well thank you so much um we are out of time i'm just going to do a quick uh share screen to give you the last slide um because it provides some of our contact information um we're interested in hearing from you. My email and Carla's email are up on the screen. And if you have an idea of something you would like to hear more about, we're going to be doing, um, I think at least two more webinars as part of this project. We'd love to get your feedback on something that you think would be important to, to survivors of family violence 
in the family law context that, that might make an interesting webinar. Um, and I just want to thank you all for attending. It was a, a really great, a great uh, evening and thank the presenters especially. You did a fabulous job, all, all uh, four of you, and we managed to finish pretty much on time. So, so that's great. So uh, I, I guess I'll say good night and um, we'll hopefully see you at our next webinar.